Hey folks, thanks for joining us today. This is Josh Roloffs, the product manager here at Wholesale Solar. We're here with Primus Wind Power to talk about wind, solar, hybrid, off-grid systems. We've worked with Primus for a number of years, uh, really experienced with the product. They're made in the USA. We have Ken Kodalik from Primus here today. Ken's gonna tell us all about wind, solar, hybrid systems. Uh, could you go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Ken? Be sure to stay tuned for a special offer. Uh, we're gonna have a coupon code at the end of the webinar for all Primus wind turbines, so stay tuned for that. And with that being said, I'll let you take it away, Ken. Well, thank you, Josh, I appreciate it. We certainly appreciate Wholesale Solar and their experience in the market, as well as their dedication to education of our customers on wind and solar and hybrid and the best off-grid system that they we could possibly uh, produce. So let me get, tell you a little bit about the agenda today. It's actually going to be about 45 minutes long. Um, the last 15 minutes will be for questions live right here on the webinar. Uh, but we are going to, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the company and a brief history of the AIR product line, which has been around for over 25 years. Um, talk about turbine types and the different applications, the different tur turbine types we have. Um, wind 101, so that would be siding and towers, just explaining uh, how this all works. Um, operation maintenance and hybrid systems, installation, uh, determining a wind resource, uh, why hybrid, why off-grid, why it makes sense to combine the two together, why that's so important for specifically an off-grid system. Um, and then we'll end with some examples of pictures of different uh, applications. Uh, and then the Wholesale Solar Special Offer that they're going to be uh, offering uh, to you guys as an incentive to check out this idea of the hybrid system. So Primus Aerospace, uh, Primus Wind Power is a division of Primus Aerospace. Um, we're based out of Denver, Colorado. We purchased the airline from Southwest Wind Power in January of 2013. We did not purchase Skystream or Whisper, if you remember those two product lines that Southwest Wind Power had. Um, our parent company, the aerospace side, is a precision metal manufacturing company for uh, Lockheed Martin, Department of Defense, NASA, etc., aerospace stuff. So uh, it, it was a logical offshoot for a wind turbine company to be part of Primus, the Primus umbrella. We produce, manufacture, engineer all the turbines right there in the Denver factory. So we're very proud of the fact that our turbines are a high quality manufactured and engineered USA product. Here's a little production, a history of the product line. Back in uh, 1995, uh, the product line was first developed in Flagstaff, Arizona, where I'm talking to you from now, um, with the Air 303 by um, Andy Cruz and David Calley from Southwest Wind Power. Then they came out with the 403, a little upgraded version three years later. And then the Air X and Air 30 in the 2011 time frame, um, that was the Air 30. And then the uh, uh, Air Breeze uh, and Air 40 was launched around that little bit after 2011. And then uh, now we have the Air Silent X, which incorporates these uh, blue blades, So, uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So lots of history of this turbine for upgrades and improvements. Lots of turbines out there, parts and pieces you can get anywhere, pretty much anywhere in the world. We have authorized service distributors all over the world. Uh, we have uh, nine of them all across the world in Europe and New Zealand and Australia and so on, Canada. And so um, have them in Latin America all over the world so that if there is a problem with the turbine, it's not an obscure turbine. It's been around for a long time, thousands and thousands of units out there. So here is that Air Silent X we talked about. Uh, it has this blue carbon fiber hand laid blade set, very, very uh, nice blade set. The, the key to this blade set is it's very quiet. Um, it's quite stiff. It also has aerodynamic trips on the uh, leading edge of the blade set, which make it quiet. Uh, a lot of different features that make it quiet. Um, and it's mostly used in our cruising sailboat market where you need a quiet turbine. So the Air Silent X, if you need a quiet marine grade turbine, that's the turbine to buy, the Air Silent X. 
you can upgrade any of our turbines to this quiet blue blade set so if you needed an industrial turbine like the air 30 is our industrial land turbine if you needed a industrial turbine for a high high speed very high wind speed industrial application but you also needed it to be quiet then you could upgrade the air 30 with the blue blades and have a very robust industrial turbine that's quiet so all of our turbines can be upgraded to this blue blade set which is very helpful let's talk a little bit about the turbine itself and the internal components first of all all of our turbines are called upwind horizontal access turbines that means the direction of the wind is this way hitting the nose cone of the blade set first and horizontal access meaning this is the rotational direction it's on a horizontal access as opposed to a vertical access turbine which you've probably seen before most modern turbines that actually produce power are horizontal access turbines so uh, my opinion they're the ones to get they have a lot less issues than the vertical access turbines and they actually achieve their power curve uh, here's the nose cone hub blade set. It is a three-bladed turbine, which is arguably uh, the best uh, number of blades for all-around wind speeds. Um, there are turbines that have two and up to seven to nine blades, um, but ours is a three-bladed, most, uh, most common and uh, most efficient design. Most of the industrial-scale turbines now our three bladed turbines here are the um, bearings right here and your face that go inside the bearings go inside the face assembly here this is the stator it has the copper windings surrounding it um, it's what produces the electrical charge with the rotor inserted inside the stator and the uh, rotor with the neodymium magnets surrounding the rotor and that uh, rotates around the stator again producing the wild ac that's uh unregulated wild ac three phase ac is what's actually produced inside the turbine and then that gets regulated up tower in the circuit card right here to 12 24 or 48 volt dc and that's what we do it's all regulated up tower so there's no need for a down tower controller keep that in mind there's no need for a down tower controller everything is done up tower our turbines are all voltage specific so if you have a 12 volt battery bank you need a 12 volt turbine it is not interchangeable in the field without replacing a whole bunch of components including the stator and the circuit card so you have to buy the specific voltage for the specific uh, system that you're looking for, battery system you're looking for. Right here is the um, potentiometer and LED harness, and there is a potentiometer screw on the side of the turbine. That's this little little thing right here. Um, and on the belly of the turbine, there's an LED light that tells you the functionality of the turbine. All of our turbines have that LED. It's either green or red, depending on the turbine. And that's probably the first question that somebody's going to ask you in tech support, other than the serial number of the turbine, is what is the LED light doing? So you need to know that there is an LED light in the belly of the turbine, and it the functionality is if it's not illuminated, then the turbine, there's not enough wind or there's not enough RPMs for the turbine to spin up and push amps. If it does become illuminated solid, that means it's spun up above about 450 RPMs and it's pushing amps. If it then begins to blink slowly, that means the turbine is in regulation, meaning that the turbine uh, has sensed the battery regulation voltage set point with the potentiometer. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And it shuts down. And it does that via, it breaks via electromagnetic braking. It's not a mechanical brake, it's an electromagnetic brake and the blade set will continue to spin slowly but it won't push amps and so that condition you will see the led light blinking slowly if the led light is blinking rapidly that means it's an overspeed protection and that happens somewhere between 30 and 35 miles per hour of wind and the turbine senses that the wind is too high and it begins to shut down um, to protect itself 
It'll then start back up again in you know two to five minutes, depending on the control algorithm of the particular turbine. It'll start back up. It'll start to push amps. If the wind is too high, it'll shut back down again. It'll continue to do that automatically until the wind dies down or your battery bank is full. So that is the functionality of that LED light. Okay, so here is a um, O-ring seal that seals the face to the nacelle. That's the body of the turbine. And then you have the yaw bearing here, snap ring. Here's the slip rings right here and the yaw itself. This yaw is what is what accepts the 1.5 schedule 40 pipe, 1.5 inch schedule 40 pipe, which is what the yaw will accept. And the wires run down the middle of that pipe. It's a standard Schedule 40 pipe that you can get at a fencing company. It's a, it's a thicker wall. It's not your EMT pipe that you get at Home Depot. It's a little thicker wall pipe for fencing and water pipes often. So keep that in mind. Schedule 40, 1.5 inch. That's ID. OD, outer diameter, is 1.875. This is all in the manual but it's good to remember that. All of our turbines accept that 1.5 inch pipe. The tail of the turbine is there to keep the turbine, as we say, on the wind. So as the wind direction changes, the wind flows over the blade set and the nacelle hits the tail and it pushes it you know, in the direction it needs to stay for the face to stay on the wind. That's the purpose of the tail. Here are our turbines themselves. Here is the air land turbine this would be the air 30 and the air 40 turbine those are our land versions it's a gray cast aluminum housing our a basic finish and here is the air x the air marine turbine that would be the air x marine the air silent x which has the blue blades we already talked about that and the air breeze right so we have and we also have some different blade sets for the different turbines we'll i'll show you a slide of that here in a minute the difference between the land and the marine turbines is all of our marine turbines have a stop switch that comes with them, and all of our marine turbines have this quality uh, marine grade finish. It's a two-part finish, a high, high uh, painted finish that's corrosion resistant, uh, very high quality aircraft quality paint. Um, that is corrosion resistant for our, our marine environment. So that is those are the those are the turbines. All of our turbines are 1.2 meter rotor diameter. They all weigh about 13 pounds. They all will accept this 1.5 inch pipe into the yaw right here. You can see those yaw bolts right there, um, and the wires run straight down the middle of the pipe. Here is a, a hybrid system overview. So. What we're doing is we're charging batteries, right? So here's your PV system charging the batteries and separate and working nicely with PV is your air turbine charging the batteries. Two separate systems, two charging resources. Let's talk a little bit about batteries. Um, the minimum battery bank requirement for an Air 30, Air X Marine or an Air Silent X turbine is about 400 amp hours. That would be four, you know, here are your, your four batteries, right? Four, amp, four 100 amp hour batteries, right? Four, uh, 400 amp hours at 12 volts, right? So if you have, that's for an Air 30, an Air X, or an Air Silent X. An Air 40 or an Air Breeze, you can use a smaller battery bank, around a 200 amp hour battery bank. But that's our rec minimum recommendation for battery bank size. If you're using a smaller battery bank than that, then we need to talk about your loads and all kinds of other factors that will determine um, why it is that we need that particular battery bank size. And the reason for that is because you can push a lot of amps into that battery bank. And if you have a small battery bank, that battery bank is going to quickly, as you're pushing high amps, say 30 or 40 amps, if you have a 100 amp hour battery bank, that voltage is going to rise very rapidly and the turbine will shut down. And then it'll shut down, the voltage will come back down to resting voltage, and, the, and then the turbine will start back up again. And it'll continue to do that until potentially after you know weeks, months, the circuit card becomes damaged and you have a premature failure in your turbine. So that's why we have that minimum battery bank recommendation. But it really depends on a lot of factors, including your loads. If you have a 
high load on that battery bank, then that may not even be an issue. But most people would not be in that case. So if you if you want to know more about that, you can certainly talk to Wholesale Solar, who understands that, as well as you, or you could call us. Here's a standard hybrid uh, di wiring diagram. Here you have your PV through your charge controller, right? No charge controller needed for the turbine. It's all up tower. And then you're going through your ammeter, your J box, your fuse breaker, battery disconnect, and so on down to your battery bank. So um, that is your solar side. On the wind side, working separately but nicely with the solar is your turbine. Remember, three wires because you have DC output just like on the solar. Um, and then you're going to go down to your ground. You have your green wire, which is your earth ground. Then you're going to go through a stop switch. Always recommend a stop switch. They are provided with every marine turbine. Ammeter, either analog or digital is a good idea. Fuse breaker, battery disconnect into your battery bank. So again, separate systems, but working really nicely together to charge those batteries. There is this optional um, thing that you can do is a diversion capable charge controller like a Morningstar TriStar 45 or a C40 made by Schneider, used to be Xantrax. And then you can dump that extra energy into a resistive load like an air heater or a water heater. Um, all that can be done. And if you want to utilize all the power coming from the PV and the turbine, on the turbine side, you turn up that um, potentiometer screw to a higher voltage so it continues to push amps. Um, and on the wind side, you would uh, uh, set your controller so it does the same thing. So you're constantly charging that battery bank right so uh, and then any excess charge above the uh, regulation voltage set point would then go to the diversion charge controller and divert it to that dump load so if you want to know more about that please feel free to call wholesale solar they do uh, provide all those components needed for a diversion load and uh, a dump so keep that in mind we did talk about the potentiometer. Here's our settings for the three different voltages that we sell, 14.1, 28.2, 56.4, but it is adjustable within this range. Most of our customers don't ever adjust the turbine voltage unless they're going with that uh, system where you can dump the excess power and then you'd adjust it up. Say if you had a 12-volt system and you wanted to dump, you'd set the voltage at you know probably 14.6, 14.8, 15, somewhere in there, uh, and then your TriStar would just dump that excess power, right? So that's how that would work. Uh, so keep th that in mind. Again, most of our customers don't ever touch these uh, voltage set points because our turbine is a bulk charger, and so what we're doing is it's on or off. There's no absorb, float, equalize, any of those charging, finesse charging like your solar does, that does not occur with our turbine. When it sees 14.1 volts, it 30 seconds to a minute later, it shuts down, it applies the electromagnetic brake, shorts the windings, the blade set will still spin slowly in high winds, but it won't push amps. Your solar then begins, to, continues to charge all the way up to that absorb, you know, 14.3, 14.4, It'll do all that last, you know, little bit left charging. We're there just to bulk charge. We're there to get it 95, 97% of the way, and then the solar will do the rest. Um, so that that is our that is our purpose. So it is a bulk charger. It is on or off. Here's a nice little thing to have. It's a wind control panel. It includes the uh, analog ammeter, stop switch, and a breaker. Um, always recommend a stop switch with all of our systems. It's a good idea to have um, for maintenance purposes, for lots of good reasons. Uh, but this just makes for uh, wiring uh, easy, uh, wind in, battery in. So if you're doing your own wiring and you're not an electrician, um, a wind control panel is a good call because it just uh, makes it easier for the installation. Uh, large, wa largest wire this will accept is a number eight. So keep that in mind. Let's talk a little this little wind 101 here, right? Let's talk a little bit about tower height. So um, when you're installing a wind turbine, obviously the higher you can get up that turbine into good laminar flow wind out of the surface roughness of the ground clutter, 
the more power you're going to get out of that turbine. And you can see right here, going from 10 meters to 14 meters, you're going to get 20% more power out of that turbine. But when you're going from, say, 30 to 45 feet, you're potentially incurring a lot of extra cost in tower, in guy wires, in foundation, in pipe. And does it make sense for a $950 retail land unit? And the answer to that is probably not. If you have to go above 45 feet, if you have to go 50 or 60 or 70 feet to get up in good laminar wind, then you may not have a good site for wind. You may just want to install more solar. So keep that in mind um, because that micro turbines are different than other types of turbines where you have to get up really high. Um, what you want to have is a good wind resource. We'll talk more about that. And what's even more important, important than uh, almost as more important than the tower height is siting the wind turbine, right? So where you put that wind, wind turbine on your property, obviously this is the best location for that wind turbine, okay? You want to put it on the prevailing wind side of any object that's going to cause turbulence like a building or trees or that sort of thing. You want it to be open to the prevailing wind as far as you can. We have a rule in wind which doesn't necessarily apply with micro wind, but it's a good rule of thumb. We call it 2250. So that's 20 feet above and 250 feet away from any object that's going to cause turbulence. Trees, your, you know, your house, etc. 2250. You can't always achieve that, but know if you're not achieving that 2250, then there is going to be um, a, a, a degradation of your power curve of your wind turbine. You will not achieve the power curve of your turbine. So keep that in mind. What's really great is um, when you have a turbine on the water because you have very little surface roughness, in this case, nice laminar flow. So the, the lakes, you know, oceans, that sort of thing, great place for wind. Um, here on a ridge top, as the laminar flow wind moves up the ridge, it begins to compress. So you have uh, tend to have really good wind on ridge tops, mountain tops. Obviously, if there's a bunch of trees here, that, that would uh, make a difference, something to keep in mind. Uh, when you're on a ridge, mesa, plateau, um, or a building, uh, you're going to have the vertical faces of that building or plateau or mesa, and that's going to uh, cause turbulent wind. That's what these little things are right here, these squiggly lines. That's turbulent wind, and turbulence is the killer of wind power. And so... If you're on in that particular situation, you are not going to fully achieve the power curve. So you just got to keep that in mind. If you're on a plateau or mesa, you got to get far enough back behind that vertical face to get back into the laminar flow. And usually you cannot do that on a building, uh, unless it's an extremely large building, but in most cases you can't do that. So, um, so you got to keep that in mind when you're doing a building install. That being said, we do have building mount kits because it's usually a very easy installation for a building mount kit. Uh, but we do have a couple recommendations. Number one, it's, it's a non-inhabited building. So you put it on your energy shed, your barn, your garage, someplace you're not going to be sleeping because that vibration of the turbine can cause some vibration into the building. And that could potentially affect you. Uh, in fact, you know, it could make noise and vibrate the building, even, especially if it's a small building. Usually large buildings, that's a non-factor, but keep that in mind. And the second thing is, is when you're installing on a building, you got to also know that the power curve will be affected and you're, and you're going to get less power, less amps out of that unit. So keep that in mind. So we, we talk a lot about this concept now. It's very popular, the hybrid concept, uh, installing multiple resources into a renewable energy system. When I talk about the hybrid solution, I'm specifically talking about off-grid because in an off-grid situation, hybrid makes a lot of sense, right? Because you don't have the grid to back you up for at night and so on. You have to have another charging source if your battery bank is not sufficiently charged and often that's a generator and generators are very expensive power. So that's why a secondary charging source like a wind turbine makes a lot of sense. I do love solar. It's on my house in Flagstaff, but solar does have some drawbacks. Solar has low output during the winter months, 
We all know that, right? The sun is lower in the sky. There's less sun hours. There tends to be more weather, etc. Solar has diminished output during uh, bad weather. And we know that you're going to get some output from the solar, but it's going to be diminished. And obviously no output at night as of yet. Haven't figured that one out yet. So uh, that's where wind power comes in because the average wind speed is higher during the winter months here in North America. Uh, air density is higher and air density is part of the wind power equation. So if we can just check this uh, geek out for a second on this wind power equation. So the three factors are air density, wind velocity, which is cubed and swept area, and air density, the, the you know, for lack of a better term, the thicker the air, the more power you're going to get out of the wind. So um, that's important. Uh, obviously, velocity, wind speed is the most important because it's cubed and it's exponential. Um, but the other one is swept area, how big that blade set is, right? So all of our blade sets are 1.2 meter. That's 46 inch rotor diameter. Um, so the bigger you get that blade, the, the generally the more power you're going to get out of that wind turbine. So keep that in mind. So and the, the next one is wind is stronger during the bad weather periods. So when there's weather, there's wind. That, that does hold true. And our turbine does produce at night. And we often have wind at night. So the, this comes down to this concept that hybrid systems are complementary, right? Solar, lots of solar in the summer, not a whole lot of wind. You ever notice that? There's not a lot of wind in the summer months here in North America, right? Unless you're in the Caribbean, right? Or the Bahamas. Uh, we in Flagstaff have monsoons, and so we get maybe an hour or two of wind in the summer uh, when the storm is blowing in, and then it's it, it, it dies down for the rest of the day, generally speaking. Um, but in the winter months, it's different, right? You have more uh, you have more storms, you have higher wind speeds, and you have a whole lot less solar. And so that's the idea that uh, Mother Nature is telling us, if I have an off-grid system, we should combine wind and solar together. Makes a lot of sense. Here's a wind resource map, a winter wind resource map. At Primus, we focus on only winter wind speed because that's when you need the help in your off-grid system. Your, uh, your solar is doing all the heavy lifting in the summer months. Um, only time you really need help on the solar on the for the batteries in the summer is when there's a storm period, and then then your tur turbine is going to do the heavy lifting. But generally in the summer, your solar is going to your batteries are going to be charged up. It's in the winter that you need the help, right? And in the winter is when you have the stronger winds. That's just how it works in North America. And so you can see here the middle of the the darker the blue color, the higher the wind speed for this map. And so here in the middle of the country right here, we have a lot of great wind. This is why all the industrial scale turbines are located in Texas and Oklahoma and so on. On the, on the coastlines, lots of good wind around the, the lakes, right? You have a lot of good wind. Mountaintops, that's what these are, these islands of wind here. So there's lots of places all over the world where you have a, a good wind speed. Um, and that's what you need to know. You need to know what your wind speed is in your area. Well, how, how, do, you do, how do you do that? We have a tool that we use. Uh, it's free for Wholesale Solar and our customers. Wholesale Solar can access this tool for you guys. You just need to provide your address if you have one or decimal data coordinates or GPS coordinates or Google coordinates for your site. Uh, we prefer decimal data coordinates if you can get them. You can usually uh, translate those from GPS or Google. Um, or an address, that's super easy as well. And then we provide you with wind resource assessment um, that's a two-page report uh, that tells you what your average monthly wind speed is and what you want to have is four meters per second or greater of winter wind. You also want to be open to the prevailing wind, right? You want to cite it properly. You want to consider the tree cover. You want to consider your turbulence, where you're going to mount the turbine on a building and all that. But it's a, it's a really good starting point to know if you're a good candidate for a hybrid system. And again, four meters per second or greater is the recommendation. You know, if you're a little bit below that and you just want to um, make sure that you have that secondary charging resource, then it's understandable, but that's kind of where you want to be. Here is what a wind resource assessment kind of looks like. Uh, it's, it's nicer than this, a little more detailed, but we provide you all this data 
provide you the monthly distribution. This is my house in Flagstaff, Arizona. And here is the turbine location. That's where that little dot is. Um, you can see that I'm kind of not doing so great. I'm close to four meters per second for my winter wind. You can see January, February. Here's November and December. Here are the 12 months of the year. And here, this is in meters per second. Um, so I want to be right in that four meters per second. By the way, that's about 10, 10 and a half miles per hour of wind is four meters per second. So um, you can see here, and this is at the tower height of 45 feet. That's what this indicates, 14 meters, 45 feet. And so it gives you all this good information here, uncertainty and the weibel and air density and everything. So in this particular case, right, I, I would kind of be on the edge of whether I'm a good candidate. Here is the uh, wind rose for that site, and that's what you need to site the turbine. So make sure when you get the report, you pay attention to the wind rose and when you purchase your turbine, you want to make sure you're in the prevailing wind direction. This is more specifically called a power rose, meaning it gives you the, the power in the wind. And most of my wind is coming out, most of the power of my wind is coming out of the southwest. I have a little bit here in, the, uh, in these other directions, tiny little bit to the northeast and east. But I would want to set my, my turbine open to the prevailing wind, which is coming out of the southwest, which is predominant in North America. Here's another site, much better wind resource, again, at 45 feet of tower height. Here's your, um, here's your uh, uh, output during the 12 months of the year. You can see that, right, the curve right there, right? Better in the, in the winter, not so good in the summer. Um, again, good site here, well above four meters per second. Here's the same site at a lower tower height. That's just, This is at 10 meters. You can see how it dropped down a little bit. The wind speed dropped down because you're on a lower tower. And then here is that same site, but gives you the wind rose, right? So here it is. It's all the way from all the way from the south to the north with, with the predominant power in the wind coming from the west northwest. And so you want to be open to this direction, which obviously this site is because here's the the turbine. He's open all the way from the north to the south. So this is a, a great site um, for wind. And obviously it's on the water. There's a lot of good characteristics for that site. So uh, we talked about this idea of, um, you know, when there's weather, there's wind. And so we looked at um, 30 years of NREL data and um, uh, at the 240 NREL sites across the country. And, uh, and we concluded that it is actually true when it's less sunny, it tends to be more windy on average during these bad weather conditions. It's more pronounced in places like Rapid City, South Dakota, with a 23% improvement but but you know also in texas and wyoming it's also uh, a factor that you're going to have when the storm is blowing in and it just kind of makes common sense when that storm is blowing in you are going to have um, more wind so something to keep in mind here is uh the complement actual complementary curves excuse me <coughs> using nrel data uh, for three sites across the U.S., you know, we got Montana, North Dakota, and Minnesota. This is the most pronounced. You can see January through December and how, you know, the red is the wind and the blue is the solar, how much this is is a really obvious complementary curve here of, of, the two, of the wind and solar resource. So it does make a lot of sense. You know, it's a lot more erratic in North Dakota and Minnesota, but generally on average you're going to have much better wind speeds in the winter months and be able to help that battery system to uh, to last longer this is kind of obvious I, I i think most of the people would say they understand this that the solar day is very different from june to december that's why most folks will size um, systems for december 21st the shortest day of the year and uh, and so, but when you're when you're talking about a hybrid system, and being able to have that input in the winter months, that whole sizing paradigm for off-grid changes drastically, because you're sizing the solar for December 21st, um, you are are are, are essentially um, saying that you know this is the worst day of the year, so you can. Uh, uh, so you can downsize potentially the solar, the racking, 
days of autonomy, the battery bank, if you have a wind turbine in the paradigm, in the mix, uh, because you know you're going to be getting amps into that turbine at night during storm periods, during the winter months. So it really changes the whole idea of how you size off-grid systems when you have that secondary charging source such as a wind turbine. But it's very different from June to December, obviously, as you can see in this uh, diagram. Also, with the wind turbine, you're going to have potentially 24 hours of charging into the battery bank, which is interesting because there is some studies coming out, and I've, in my conversations with battery manufacturers, there is some there is some data to support the fact that if you have a more consistent charging resource into your battery bank, that is better for the battery bank, even if it's just a trickle charge of a half an amp or one or two amps. Uh, that consistent charging into the battery bank a, as you have a load on the battery bank is really good for the turbine. Because if you have a solar-only system, you're only going to be charging, say, four to six hours a day. You know, And if there's a storm period, it could be shorter, winter months, and so on. So you have to get all those amps into your battery bank during that relatively short period of time. But with a secondary charging source, you're, if the wind is blowing, you're obviously putting amps into that battery bank to help that battery bank last longer. And nighttime is one of those times when your battery bank, you know, loads are off and on at night, right? Lights, all the things that you need at nighttime when generally when most people are home, they're using uh, the loads in their house. So uh, it's important to have that charging resource at night as well. So it's all about keeping the battery bank happy. This is a, a Trojan brochure of a battery bank discharge. And uh, this is actually a little bit of an older brochure. Most uh, ma battery manufacturers now only recommend a maximum 80% depth of discharge, not 100%. Because if, if your depth of discharge is this low at 100%, then basically your battery is dead. And it's going to be very difficult to get it back due to sulfation. So 80% is what's typically recommended for max. And what systems are designed it for is 50%. But if you can get that um, that rate in the 30 to 40 percent max depth of discharge, if you can get it in here, you can greatly extend your battery life. Because look, you're going from, and these are just different battery types: AGM, flooded, gel, etc. But if you you go say from thousand cycles to to you know 2,000 cycles here, right? Then that's you know multiple years difference. Um, between a solar only system versus a, a hybrid system and that makes a lot of sense because batteries are expensive they always fail at the absolute terrible the worst times uh, and so to keep those batteries happy is really critical in an off-grid system so these are here's the power curves any turbine worth its salt is going to have a power curve this is a power curve versus this which is an energy curve and let me explain the difference a power curve is instantaneous power in watts and that's how wind turbines are rated and this is important for you to know uh, because you see oh this Chinese this turbine is rated at 600 watts this turbine is rated at 400 watts um, the air X air X marine and air silent X is rated at 400 watts the Air Breeze and the Air 40 are actually rated at 160 watts. So people think, oh, I want to buy the higher rated, higher wattage output turbine. But you really need to understand that that rating is just instantaneous power at any particular second in the power curve. It's just watts. Really what you should be looking at is power over time, which is the energy curve. So. Um, so it really depends on what you're looking to do with that turbine. This power curve, here is the red is the Air 40, the Air Breeze. The blue is the Air 30, the Air X Marine, and the Air Silent X. And you can see, actually, the Air 40, the Air Breeze will outperform the Air 30 at the lower wind speeds, which is exactly what those turbines are designed to do. If, if you want a turbine that's quiet, and is in a low to moderate wind speed environment, you know the wind doesn't blow hard there, then the Air 40, the Air Breeze is the way to go. If you have, you know, you don't have really strong high winds, 
and you need a quiet turbine, the Air 40, the Air Breeze, the Air Silent X is a good way to go. And you can see by the power curve, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually do better in those low wind speeds. And it's because that particular turbine is designed, it's got a different blade set, a wider blade set. It's designed to do better in low wind speeds. But at the higher wind speeds and higher RPMs of the Air 30, the Air X Marine, you're going to do better. And that's why we recommend the Air 30, the Air X Marine for industrial environments, high wind environments like offshore, uh, high wind sites for oil and gas, telecom, places where you, you, you could see 60, 70, 80 miles per hour wind because our Air 30, our Air X Marine turbine is very robust. It's designed as our industrial turbine. And it can output higher wattage instantaneously. So you can, you can go up well above 400, whereas the uh, Air 40 Air Breeze is, you know, is is at maxes out right right around 200 to 250 right so so you really need to know your wind resource and what you need from that turbine and also the sound output because the air x and the air 30 is loud um so but if sound is a, is no concern because you're at an industrial site telecom oil and gas etc then the Air 30, the Air X is likely the best way to go. So certainly we can talk to you more about that if you have questions on that. But really, energy is what you need, energy over time, not instantaneous power. And that's how turbines are rated, unfortunately, here in the United States. We at Primus are trying to change that. Um, turbines in Europe and other places are rated by their rotor diameter but and not rated power, which can be fooled with so really power over time is what you want to look at and rotor diameter so here's the power over time curve the energy curve and again you can see the air 40 the air breeze does a little bit better than the air 30 in those low wind speeds and these two curves these two lines begin to converge as you get up higher into the um, into the wind speed so that's the difference in the energy curve and that's why it's important Last thing I want to talk about before I show you a bunch of pictures is maintenance. And so on our website, under the support tab, primuswindpower.com, under the support tab, if you go down to maintenance and repair, you're going to see a great video on maintaining our turbine. And it's really very simple, and there's really not much maintenance involved. We build a quite robust, reliable turbine. We do that purposefully because we know that the turbine is going to be in very remote locations. And uh, we also know that solar is very reliable with you know, little to no maintenance. And so we have to compete with that. So really the only maintenance for our turbine is you have to check the blade set about every year and a half or so. See, there's no significant chips, dings, or things like that. Uh, it is a balanced three-bladed set. So if you have a chip in one of the blades, significant chip or a crack, you will need to replace the whole set. Blade sets are fairly affordable, $120 retail for a standard black blade set, molded set. The blue blades are more expensive. They're more like $350 um, because they're carbon fiber hand laid. Um, then you also need to check your blade bolt connection to your hub and your uh, yaw bolt connection to the, to the tower pipe. And make sure those are all nice and tight. Um, and that's really in terms of maintenance. That's all you really need to do. In terms of long-term maintenance, I will tell you that the stator, the rotor, 20-year design life plus. We've, we've seen those things last 20, 30 years. I mean, long time. They're very robust. The, 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 the things that, that fail after seven to nine years on the turbines are the bearings. So you have to replace the bearings. Um, the circuit card and brushes that uh, because it's power electronics will begin to fail and then as I, as I talked about the blades will seven to nine years so those are really the three maintenance items the blades the bearings and the circuit card the bearing set is like 50 bucks for the yaw and the face bearings uh, and the circuit card for a, a full replacement kit which includes a circuit kit uh, brushes new o-ring uh, a few other items in there as well. Uh, that's uh, retail $240. So really relatively in inexpensive to repair the units if they do have a problem. Um, 
and they, um, like I said, last you know seven, eight, nine years, some even longer, um, depending on the environment, how uh, corrosive the environment is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors there, but that that's the the maintenance cycle of the turbine. So here is a 45-foot uh, tower kit uh, on this turbine here in this small cabin operation. You can see the eight guy wires and the 1.5 Schedule 40 pipe. It's a 45-foot kit. That's the tallest tower kit we sell. In terms of towers, guy wires are the cheapest and best way to go. Our kits do not include the pipe, um, so you source the pipe locally, but it's a really inexpensive way to go if you're okay with the guy wires coming down. Here's another guide wire kit at a remote location, very remote location as you can see here. <laughs> Great wind location though, obviously. Uh, solar, or excuse me, uh, this is a uh, marine application with a mast and stay kit here, 11 foot mast and stay kit on this beautiful sailboat. Another beautiful sailboat, here's the uh, turbine here up on the mast right here. Uh, a couple turbines uh, with solar right here on this uh, sailboat. This is a parking lot light configuration with the turbine and the solar combined together to power this parking lot light. The, the one issue with this picture is that this parking lot light is very close to this turbine causing some turbulence. So you gotta obviously keep that in mind when you're installing solar on uh, the same tower as your, as your turbine. So just something to keep in mind. Here is um, industrial applications, oil and gas in this particular case. Uh, very short towers, but these are West Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, Eastern Colorado, places that have great wind resource. And so generally, because there's very little turbulence, except the cows wandering around, um, then uh, you don't need to be on a very tall tower. So that's something to keep in mind. In fact, many of our industrial sites, the towers are you know 15 or 20 feet. Generally, our sweet spot is somewhere between 30 and 45 feet for a tower, but uh, it really depends on your wind resource and the and the uh, surface roughness of the uh, site. Uh, here is a, a nice a hybrid configuration. Uh, it's a, a pallet that's movable. It has the whole kit in there with the batteries, the solar. This is a Roan self-supporting lattice tower with the stub pole of the 1.5 Schedule 40 pipe uh, for the uh, uh, turbine th themselves. Nice little system. Uh, this is a mining application here. We do a lot with mining. This is an airport application where they need um, scare away the birds and that sort of thing. So that's what this is for. Here is uh, Antarctica. This is a um, science station at the bottom of the world. You can tell that by the vertical solar panels. Multiple wind turbines. Uh, very obviously a very high wind site here. Uh, one thing I want to point out is when you're doing multiple turbines, you got to make sure that the upwind turbine doesn't shadow the downwind turbine, so it needs to be a different elevation, so you don't have that downwind shadowing effect from the upwind turbine. Something to keep in mind when you're doing a multiple turbine installation. Again, here, two different elevations here for these two turbines, solar and wind, on this buoy platform here. Telecom. Uh, doing a lot with telecom these days because of the fact that uh, the power consumption for telecom has come down greatly. So uh, they can power up their sites, their remote sites with solar and wind often. Uh, a railroad application here, positive train control. They used to do power up these remote sites with propane generators. Now they're predominantly using uh, solar and wind and uh, makes those that generator time a lot less, saves them a bunch of money. Here is a uh, beautiful Palapa here in the Sea of Cortez and this Westphalia hybrid system for this uh, um, VW. Um, I just like this picture. And then uh, here is Alaska, um, wind turbine doing really well, but uh, solar panel not so much, uh, quite iced over. So lots of good stuff there. Uh, and thank you for listening and thank you for being a part of this webinar today. So Wholesale Solar would like to provide a special offer for you, basically 10% off on any uh, Primus Air Turbine, the Air 30, the Air 40, the Airx Marine, Air Breeze, and Air Silenex. And if I could just review one more time, the Air 30 is our industrial land turbine. The Air 40 is our 
uh, uh, more residential turbine for low to moderate wind speed applications where sound is of a concern. The Eryx Marine is our marine industrial turbine for offshore buoy platforms, things like that. The Breeze is designed for uh, marine applications. It's, our, again, a marine turbine uh, that is for lower wind speed applications. And then the Air Silent X is our, our cruising sailboat application uh, where you need to have those. That's the one with the blue blades. And it needs to be very quiet, often in a cruising sailboat situation. Uh, that you can do that. And again, I would remind you that those, bleed, those blue blades are compatible with any of our turbines. So all you need to do is uh, use that coupon code WIN10 um, when ordering, and this will be available for 60 days from today, which would be, uh, in 60 days, that would be June 30th. It's, it's May 2nd today. So um, that is uh, the offer from Wholesale Solar, our distributor. And so if you have questions, feel free to contact Wholesale Solar. Um, and uh, there's their talk, contact information with their email and the website. They have an amazing website uh, that uh, provides a lot of information for you. I want to thank you again for being on the webinar today. We will take some questions, but I'm going to stop this recording now. And again, please reach out to us with any follow-up questions that you might have uh, about the Primus Air wind turbine and this hybrid concept. So again, have a great day. Thank you so much. Hopefully this was informative for you.